things brown bag lunch i just wanted to also let you know about some other upcoming programs we have uh, again all food related so um, if you're hungry i apologize uh, <laughs> but on september 18th we have a program with chef mary she is part of chicago federation of chefs and she's um, going to be offering the class historic recipes in today's kitchen and that will be over at High V at 6.30 p.m. So registration for that is required, and uh, it will it's, it's right on our website. Then on September 19th, this will be here at the History Center. Some of you may know Jo Cessna. She teaches through Northwestern's uh, Medicine's uh, Leishman uh, Center for Healthy Eating. She's gonna be doing a series of programs with us um, called Cooking Seasonally, and this September class is gonna be about apples, so perfect time of year to be talking, like anything apples is wonderful. Uh, I'm gonna do a little teaser here for September 26th. We're gonna have a Del Monte reunion, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but uh, that is planned here for September 26th from 6 to 8 p.m. Then on October 1st, uh, we have, uh, it was a rescheduled program from June for our brown bag lunch, Indigenous Pathways to Food Sovereignty uh, with Jessica Panicott uh, at the Sycamore Library at 6.30 p.m. Then on October 3rd, we have our next brown bag lunch, and that one's going to be a sneak preview into the house walk that we always do during Pumpkin Fest. So it'll be a preview of the homes and um, we'll share the theme, and um, it's always kind of a, just a fun afternoon. Later that evening, we have a program called Food and Poetry, Eat Your Words. Uh, we're gonna have four local poets uh, sharing their thoughts and um, perspectives on food through poetry. Then on October 6th, yeah, I mean, man, we've got a lot going on here. I've got a second page. Uh, on October 16th, we have an evening of encores with Carrie Banks. Uh, she graduated from Sycamore High School. She's in their music a hall of fame. She's going to be back in town, and she is going to be doing a performance here at the History Center. Uh, there's no charge for that, but we're asking for donations, but registration for that is also online. On October 6th, we have our annual cemetery walk. That's traditionally that first Sunday in October at 1 p.m. And then in November, we have a pasta class. So homemade pasta um, over at hy -Vee on November 13th. Again, all those details are on our website. Uh, so lots of exciting ways that you can connect with food. And if you go see the exhibit, you'll see there's like a million stories we can tell about food. Uh, the challenge of doing an exhibit is I had to do 80 words about each topic in there. So these programs are opportunity to kind of take a little bit of a deeper dive. So with that, I'm going to hand it over here to Audrey to talk about what's going on at the Ellen House. Thank you. Um, I am going to keep it very short and sweet for the Elwood House. Um, the biggest thing that we have coming up in DeKalb is Wine on the Terrace. It's our biggest fundraiser of the year. If you haven't been before, it's very fun. There's live music. We've got wine samples as far as the eye can see. And uh, there will be food. And it's just a really fun event. Um, it's September 14th from 4 to 7 p.m. Tickets are on our website, elwoodhouse.org, or you can always stop in at the Elwood House Museum if you'd like to purchase them. Um, thank you all again for coming. And that's truly all I'm going to share today. <laughs> so now I am going to introduce you to Ann Schottke. She is going to be leading um, our discussion today. But I just want to kind of put this out there that Anne just came in one day to do research here at the History Center, and then um, during the conversation, she's like, oh, do you guys, do you look for volunteers? Do you guys ever have volunteers? She's like, oh, yeah, we always need volunteers. Some of you in this room are very familiar with how that conversation goes. Uh, so she started volunteering, and as we were preparing for our food exhibit, I'm like, you know, I really need some help uh, in learning about Del Monte. We know they had a factory here, but we don't have anything in our collection at all about this story. So she is going to share what she has been able to. She is now our local expert um, in Del Monte. And um, I just look forward to continuing this conversation because, as I said, a year ago, we really didn't have anything. Um, so we have a lot of work to do, but this is certainly a great starting point. So with that, I will turn it over to Ann. All right, 
right, if you are Del Monte plant number 111, raise your hand. <laughs> All right, got a couple hands up. If you are with Del Monte Farms 201, raise your hand. And the rest of you, family, friends? Curious. Oh, just curious. All right, very good, very good. Well, uh, again, my name is Ann yeah. Schultz. What's my connection to Del Monte? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> um, I am a retired high school teacher. I taught at DeKalb High School for 23 years. And uh, as Michelle said, I, I, I came here because I was looking for something to do. And this has been quite a journey. Um, I knew Del Monte existed when I first moved to the area back in 1990. Um, but, you know, didn't know much about it. So I am very excited to share this with you. If you see, two, I, I accidentally posted this twice. One says the history of Del Monte, and another one online says a history of Del Monte. I was debating, and now I'm wishing I would have stuck with a history, because, as Michelle said, you are going to provide a whole bunch of additions to this story. Uh, as former employees, as family members, uh, just a community member living near the factory or living near one of the farms, there's a lot more that we can learn about this. And I was so fortunate to um, hear back from our guest panelists today. So Harlan Hawkins and Sherry Pacor are joining us a little later um, in this presentation to share. It. And the, the items that we have here on display, items that we have in the uh, food exhibit, most of that stuff, they were very kind enough to loan to us so that we could share it with you and the rest of the community. Um, I was also very fortunate to um, make a contact with Carissa Sauer at Del Monte Foods in California, and she helped us with a few items, so we're very grateful. And I'm going to set my timer because I can tell a story for a long time. <laughs> so just a couple things. Just so you're aware, we are recording this. Uh, we feel because we haven't had that to get Del Monte history, we want to make sure that we get some of this information and the information from our speakers later on. I know people have lots of stories to tell. I'm going to ask you to refrain from sharing those today because as was mentioned, we're going to have a Del Monte reunion, and one of the purposes of that reunion is to record some of the oral histories. So we're hoping later on that you will come back and share some of your tales of Del Monte with us. If you need a restroom, restrooms are down the hallway on the left. Feel free to get up as you need. Again, if you want to visit the exhibit after the presentation, feel free or come back some other time. And I just ask that you turn off your cell phones for right now or put them on mute or whatever that works. So we need to go back. Oh, and before I start talking about this, I know there are gaps in the story. I mean, I've kind of indicated that. Michelle has indicated that. Pretty much everything I have learned has been from newspaper articles. And there are some gaps, and we know some things may not be correct. So, and things change um, with, with Sherry and Harlan. Some of that technology that they knew when they left is going to be different than when Del Monte started back in the 1920s. So it will be interesting to hear how that technology changes, too. So it was first announced in August 1925 that Rochelle Canneries needed to expand. They were not meeting their demands for corn and peas, and so the idea came that they were going to build two new factories, a second one in Rochelle, and then they decided to reach out to DeKalb and build another factory in DeKalb. The idea was to I just want up there, Herman. Huh? not only one. build a new factory in DeKalb, but they wanted to okay. lease 4,000 acres of farmland to raise the peas and the corn that they would need for that packing. So that that 4,000 acres would be within a seven to eight mile radius. And one of the things I'm trying to do with some of the plat books and some of the articles I'm reading is trying to find who some of those farmers were on the plat maps. So I have, a, I have maybe about four or five, um, but that's gonna take more work and I may not find everybody. So if you know anybody, let me know. 
In October of 1925, ground was broke. Communication with the city of DeKalb, the sewers, the electrical, they were all starting to make way to put up this new factory. And in 1926, Rochelle Canneries changed and it became Midwest Canning Corp Corporation. So this was the first time we hear of Midwest Canning. Ralph Brown, who was vice president of Rochelle Canneries, then became president of Midwest Canning. Now I'm gonna ask you to hang on to that information a little bit about Midwest Canning Corporation because I have a question and I might need some help and maybe you know the answer and help me with that. We'll address that later. By 1924, they have four lines of production going. That was what they were built for, four lines. It was top notch, first mechanical, um, best of the day to process the corn and the peas. By they tried it a little bit. They weren't ready for a Monday, so they pushed it back to a Thursday later in the week in July, and by then they were able to get all four lines going. They were able to package it and can it and get the labels going. I just need to, there's a lot of information, so I have a little cheat sheet, so I just want to make sure I get all this. There's a lot going on. Um, by this time, they had received peas from all nine farms. So at this point, they had nine farms that were producing for the factory for canning. On inspection day, everybody was invited. It wasn't just the Chamber of Commerce. Housewives, come on over, see how your food is being prepared, right? So they were taking it all in and bringing all these people in. Um, they had about 100 people visit the factory and see what this was all about. And they walked them through the process. Now again, this is probably gonna be a little bit different because we didn't have some of the robotic machinery and things that are existing now. So, what they described in the newspaper, the Daily Chronicle, was that the peas came from the field, they went into a hopper, they went then into washing tanks, and a squirrel cage. So the washing tanks would remove some of the debris, some of the dirt, and then the squirrel tanks were actually tanks that had screens on them that would trap the peas, but let some smaller pebbles or fragments of other debris that might be caught in the peas kind of shift through. The process between the water tanks and the squirrel cage took about 400 to 600 gallons of water. So there was a lot of water going through there. Once the peas passed through the squirrel cage, they went, went through a blanching machine, and this is sort of a cooking pro a basic cooking process, introductory. I'm gonna look to Harlan here a lot to kind of guide me along. <laughs> um, then they would go through inspection tables and there would be people lined up along the inspection tables and anything that didn't get pulled out in the water tanks or the squirrel cage would then be picked out by hand. Any, any um, vine debris or anything like that. Then uh, the peas were sent to a syrup machine where they were canned and sealed. Now in those days, the cans were sealed um, by hand. Each, each worker would seal the cans versus doing it through the, um, through the machine. And um, Sherry, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this right. It's a retorch cooker? Retort. Retort cooker, thank you. A retort cooker, which would then take the cans and it would uh, be set at 248 degrees, 15 pounds of pressure for 23 minutes. All right? And then from there, it would go to packing and casing and this is the thing, at that time, they did not put the labels on before they shipped them out because they wanted the companies that bought the product to put their own labels on it. So at this point, is it Del Monte? I don't know, uh, that's one of the questions we have to figure out. So this picture here, it is a factory, the plant. Now, I am guessing this is from the early 1930s, and the only reason I'm guessing that, because there's no identif identifying marks on the back of the photo, is you really need good eyes, but I just use my iPhone with a magnifying lens, and if you look at the cars right here, 
they just sort of remind me of cars from the late 20s, early 30s. I'm thinking of Dillinger driving around Chicago or whatever. You know? <laughs> so um, that's what I identify it as. So uh, that, I'm, I'm guessing on that. I have no exact date on that. Um, but if you look carefully, you'll notice the water tower, yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can everyone see that? So in 1929, Del Monte adds that water tower. The water tower is 87 feet high and it holds 100,000 gallons of water. Now that seems to make sense because we're blanching peas, we're cooking them, we want to make sure they're clean. I mean, 4,600 gallons, you know, of water is being used to clean the peas. But what was interesting and why I put the word innovation here is because this water also served as a sprinkler system in case there was a fire. So when the heat came up and there was pressure, then those sprinklers would come on to put out any fires that existed in the building. I don't know when sprinkler systems actually were invented. I don't know when they started going into factories, but we have a starting date at least here with this factory in Dekelma. I didn't find much in the 1930s on Del Monte. But I will say, at, in 1929, I found one little blurb, and this gets back to my, before I get to this story, the, the one little blurb I found was that there was a gentleman who was an auditor for California Packing Company returning from Midwest Canning. So this is the first time I'm hearing CalPAC, California Packing Company. And did CalPAC own this company, you know, own Midwest Canning the whole time? I don't know. We'll, we'll throw another monkey wrench into it later, so we'll just, just, again, okay, keep, keep, just listen for that. So, war, World War II. There's a lot going on, and men are being sent off, our young sons are being sent off to war, and some of the first articles that are coming out are about women, save your food, don't waste food. All right, we only have so much, and we want to make sure our boys have food to fight. <laughs> so after a, a, a few days, a month later or so, now we start to see ads that Del Monte wants to hire women. They want them to join the workforce. There were some women on the line doing the inspection part and pulling peas and stuff, but now it's become a much bigger process. We need women running all the machinery, maybe delivering the, the cans or whatever it is going to the different places. And they adopt a, a new motto during the war, and it's really hard to read there. It says, unless you pack it, our boys can't eat it. That was the motto during the war years. Unless you pack it, our boys can't eat it. So this was one of the not quite quarter page ads that went into the Daily Chronicle. Here's another one. We need your help now. And early on in 1943, there was an article that says, you know, Del Monte's hiring bankers. We've got insurance people. We've got, um, you know, bakers. We got, we're pulling everybody from all walks of life to come work in the factory so that we can make sure that the product gets out, we don't waste the food, because if we don't draw women into the factory, the peas are gonna go to waste, the corn's gonna go to waste, so we have to make sure this stuff gets packed. And this is the evidence of that. So this is a picture taken by the US Navy, and this shows, I, you can't read it, I understand that, but <laughs> it's kind of smudged, it was the best copy I could find. But these are cases of CalPAC product being sent overseas. So this was really important. So I did find one article that said there was a, and it just said Corporal Bob, no last name. And it makes me wonder if it was maybe um, something that the corporate office was doing to try to instill some pride and patriotism in the idea of packing the food. But Corporal Bob was saying, I've been seeing lots of articles from the Chronicle and that we are really appreciative. He goes, I'm stationed here in Italy. 
and we're seeing those cow pack boxes and we're very appreciative of seeing that food and knowing that we're being fed and people back home are doing their job and helping us in this effort and so um, and, and the reason I question whether the Corporal Bob was from the DeKalb County is there wasn't a lot of information about just Corporal Bob. You know? So that's what? So that's why I'm just kind of not sure if he was really someone from DeKalb or if it was something that Cal Pack was just trying to instill and in, you know spread in all the newspapers and help people out. Regardless. It's, a, I'll be honest, I read it again this morning, I read it a couple times, I read it again this morning, I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm getting a little goosebumpy on that one. That one's kind of, you know, it's kind of good to see that, you know, helping out our soldiers when they're overseas by making sure they're well fed. This was a big deal, and this was, we didn't realize we had photos of this event. For all the work that plant number 111 and the Rochelle plant 109 did during the war, the War Food Administration and the U.S. Army awarded Plant 111 the Achievement A Award. This was a huge deal. This was a big deal. Hayes Jim, I guess it was still in school at the time, hosted this event. This brought in uh, Colonel Bernard Finnan from, he was um, stationed in Chicago at the moment. Uh, from a head some office in, in Chicago, came out along with other people. I think, let me see if I can read, well, I'll read from here instead of stretching across here. Um, yeah, I can't read that. <laughs> um, but there were uh, people from, uh, a dean from a university, there were um, uh, some department of I'm sorry, I can't read, I don't remember the names. You'll have to forgive me. Lots of history here. I can only, my file cabinet's only so big, so I, I do the best I can. So this was a big deal. In fact, this was such a big deal, it took up three pages in the daily, full pages in the Daily Chronicle. That's how big of a deal this was. That was how important it was that the War Food Administration honored the workers who came in who were not necessarily Del Monte employees to begin with, but they came in and they did their job and they, they helped uh, honor and pack all that food. So the award is given and this is what the event looked like. A couple photos here of the event. So on, on the photo on the left, um, Colonel Bernard Finn is the gentleman in uniform on the right hand side of the left photo. Um, and then you see some other dignitaries there in the lower left hand corner of that same photo. We have, I, I think it's a high school, I think it might be the Hell High School Band, I'm not positive. But in the right hand photo, I don't, you probably can't see it, but there's a military band performing. this flag over its property for the day. I asked, I asked my contact at Del Monte Foods in California, she had a lot of stuff to show me, she sent me some pictures. Do you know anything about this flag? Can you, can you find this flag for me? I would love to have it for our exhibit. She knew nothing about it, couldn't find it. So I'm guessing, and I don't know if this is accurate, I'm wondering because we're in the middle of a war, if there was just one or two flags and they'd let them fly it for the day and then take it down and take it to the next company and let it fly. So um, that's what I'm guessing is happening. So in addition to this big ceremony and this music and these speeches going on, they found um, a serviceman to award the employees with pins. And each employee got one of these pins for the Achievement Award. Now, Bernard Schwartz, I don't think is a DeKalb employee. I don't know where he was employed with Del Monte. This was just one we found. And I tried finding one of these two. I was hoping I could find someone that had this pin, but 
didn't have any luck. So I just wanted to show you this as a sample. Employees would come on stage, the servicemen would pin it to their lapels, and everyone walked through. So this was kind of, this, again, this was, this was a big deal for our country and for DeKalb to um, put all this information together. This is Harlan's photo that he shared with us. Again, looking at, I'm a daddy's girl, so cars are my thing, you know? So I'm just going by the cars, and I confirm with Harlan, this is probably around 19, in the 1940s, based on the, the cars present. Um, you think it's later? Okay. Early 50s. Early 50s? Well, I think if, uh, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, if I put the C in front of 1945, it gives me a 10-year Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm safe. Absolutely. <laughs> plus or minus, so I catch the early 50s there. All right. Or almost the early 50s. Um, the water tower is still there. I don't know if you observed, but there's only two stacks now for the coal. In that earlier picture I showed you, there were four. So two of the stacks are gone. <coughs> and under the little Del Monte sign in the picture, um, I was informed that's coal sitting under there, so coal power. And just some pictures from the inside of the factory. And when I looked at that on my computer, I think that's actually lima beans on the left versus peas. They look a little larger. The one on the right is the retort. Thank that, you. That's what the peas were cooked in, but the peas were in a basket. Oh, and okay. They, there's rails on there that the baskets would roll in and cook, hook to each other. And so when you pull one out, it would bring the one behind it out. Nice. So that makes it easy so you don't have to keep going in and grabbing another one. It looks like it came unhooked, and that's what he's doing. Oh, so he's trying, fixing it? Well, he's trying to pull it out. So oh, okay. And not get run over. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. yeah, we want to prevent that. Yeah. We want to prevent those safety accidents at work. So processing the ears of corn on the left. And would that be an inspection table on the right? Do you know? Would that be where they would inspect the peas or? I think that's where they're seeing how well they're being cleaned. Oh, okay. In this, the inspection table would come after this. Okay, all right, great. See, I have my knowledge back up. This is good. So I didn't find a lot on farms, so um, in, in newspapers and stuff. So as I said earlier, Midwest Canning wanted to lease 4,000 acres of farmland to raise corn and peas. So in, again, some of the, the information that was on loan to us, these are contracts, 1931, 31 through 1932. Arthur Dodge, his farm was um, contracted by Midwest Canning to um, grow some of this product. We have a couple of those pea boxes on display in the food exhibit. Um, one, again, Harlan was kind enough to loan to us. We also have another one on loan from the Mendota Historical Museum. So they helped us out as well. And again, I think that's lima beans on the right. I'm gonna jump in and interrupt you. I have a glass of water here. Do you want to? <laughs> so we have someone that brought one in for us today. Um, <laughs> I don't, it doesn't, I don't see a number on it. Do you know what number, number, number it's from? Oh, it's from 111. 111, it is from 111. All right, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Put that over nice here. Right. Very nice. <laughs> That's from 111. Wow, Sam Hey, Sam. I always see him about that. <laughs> Right. 
Kenny Jones. Yeah. Next. Yep. <laughs> so pictures that um, Sherry sent are shared with us. Really good contract negotiations. Sherry, when was this picture? Do you know what year that was? I couldn't. I tried looking for it in newspapers. I couldn't find it. Early 90s. Early 90s. Yeah. Okay. So early 90s, there was another one where negotiations between management and employees went really, really well. But in 1939, communication was a little bit off. There were a handful of workers in 1939 that walked off the line into Cal because the rumor was Rochelle was get employees were getting paid more. And so they walked off and it didn't last long. I think they went out at 2 p.m. and like within about half an hour, an hour later, they were back on the line um, because the representative came out and said, no, that's not true. You're getting the same pay. And so there was another walk out at 4 p.m. But then it, it, it was just a matter of hours. and. True, not true, I don't know. The contract in the middle are for the growers. So the growers ended up on a contract as well. Where are my farmers in here? Farm? All right. Oh, I want to read prices back then. <laughs> See what you think. Okay, so 1967. And it says there, for those of you who can't read it in the back, Quality Vegetable Growers Association, a bargaining, a bargaining marketing affiliate of the Illinois Agricultural Association. So in 1967, prices increased. So early peas went from $4.75 $4 to $5.05 per hundred pounds. Hard peas went from $2.20 to $2.75. Yeah, what is a hard pea? I don't remember. It's an old pea. It's an old pea. Old pea. Oh, that reminds me of another story I got to share. So while I'm thinking about this other story I shared, I saw a small article that said, um, uh, we're going to change the hours at the factory because it's too hot out. I'm like, oh, is that nice? Still, money doesn't want the workers to be out when it's too hot out. No, new workers had to do with the fact that the peas would mature too quickly. They were good, so they shifted the hours to the evening. And uh, I'm not saying Gamai didn't treat their employees well. I just, I was just kind of excited about that one enough. Corn. Let's talk about corn prices. So yellow corn went from $19.50 to $21.50 a ton. White corn was increased to $23.50 a ton. So those were the prices in 1967 that a farmer would earn for his product. One of the other things that the Del Monte factory had, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lewis Johnson opened a restaurant on site. And um, the restaurant was a place for employees who either didn't want to go home for lunch or they had no home to go to because occasionally Del Monte would, it, they would stay at the bunkhouses on, on, on the property. And occasionally Del Monte would tr bring in workers from Chicago who would take the train to Geneva, get off, get bus to DeKalb, get bus to Rochelle, and then they would stay for however many days they wanted to stay. And so these people needed access to food. So the restaurant in 1928 and beyond uh, would serve three meals a day. And I don't know if you can see it up there, but for one meal back then, they, they went through 82 pounds of pork loin <laughs> and a bushel of potatoes serving three meals a day. On the left is a contract for one of the cooks who served people working on the fields. So Doris Clark earned 40 cents a meal that she served at one of the farms. This is 1938. And there was also a pay stub for her for cooking the meals and preparing the meals in addition to serving them. And then meal tickets. And if we have time, Harlan, I, I think that the 
keeping the money in the property you were explaining to me a couple of months ago about you know having the tickets and the paycheck if, if, if you have a moment to share that that would be great but I think I think the economy of Del Monte was interesting that was kind of an interesting thing all right how many had your ear corn at the corn fest <laughs> oh okay then you know how many people going okay well the corn boil originally started as kind of a, a celebration or a fundraiser. Or I, I didn't quite understand for the DeKalb Daily Chronicle. Chuck Raymond used to run the Chronicle back in those days. Yep. And he and Leroy Levine had the steam engine and they would boil the corn. And they would, I, would, I was shocked. I didn't realize that they harvested the corn early in the morning the day of the event. I had no idea. I had no idea. So that was really fascinating. And then they would serve it. And I don't know what today's numbers are, but let me see if I can find numbers from 1988. We're looking at 30,000 to 35,000 years of corn in 1988. I don't know how that has grown. I don't know if it's, I, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this, don't tell Michelle, but the first beer garden was 1979. <laughs> so that probably, and then, you know, then they added events and everything else. So it's really grown from just a corn boil to the festival that we know it today, so. All right, there, there are some downsides. <laughs> and between me and the others of us who work here, probably one of the common things we hear, excuse me. Can I get a fan? No. Um, one of the things we hear about the most is the smell that runs through the uh, at the time that the factory was in operation. But in the, the environmental problem started um, back in 1929 when and I don't know how Del Monte's water system worked, the sewage system worked, or where it was being drained to. But in this situation, uh oh, in this situation, the water got passed, went through the pipes. It was some of the blanching liquid, and it was some of the, the pea vines and leaves and things like that, that escaped, and it dumped into the Kishwaukee River over by the Taylor Street Bridge which I'm thinking back then they called the Malta Bridge back in the day, um, the Malta Road Bridge. So that was when things started. The factory put in, over time, put in a sluice gate and tried to capture some of that. They locked it in place so some of that, that debris couldn't get past. The odor coming from the, stop, the, the piles of pea vines and scraps, and then eventually the building of the, the two giant ponds they had to help deal with the blanching fluid, um, which helped, but then another time, and I don't know if it was the, the 69 project or if it was in the early 70s, they would have the, the husks from the corn in there and they thought, oh, we got these ponds, that'll take care of the problem, and the blanching liquid, you know, filter things out. Well, the problem was, when you put plants in a pond and they don't have adequate oxygen to break down, you get some algae there, and you get some other things going, so the smell continued. So there's, there's some other, so the smell was kind of a thing, and um, unfortunately, uh, some fish stuff going on, so a little restitution there for a fish kill, some of that. So at this point, even though the Del Monte name was on the factory, it was really recognized as California Packing Company. And John Countryman, President John E. Countryman, I don't know the relation to Judge Countryman. That's one of my questions I'm gonna be investigating. He became president, he, he worked both in the Decal plant, he worked in the Rochelle plant, he became a supervisor, he went on to become president of Del Monte. He went on to become CEO. He went on to the board of trustees. So he has a very lengthy history here with Del Monte and that is one of the things I want to look into more. But anyhow, 
People knew Del Monte. It was a brand. The ads are in the, in the newspapers. Buy your corn at your local grocery. Buy your canned goods. And so the decision was made to change it from CalPAC to Del Monte. Um, I, I couldn't find the article for the other one, but 1978, R.J. Reynolds purchases Del Monte. And then I think in the 80s, Nabisco purchased them. Does that sound right to some people? Yeah. OK. <clears throat> This was another thing that I really liked that was cool, was that Del Monte voluntarily put nutritional information on their labels in 1973. This didn't become law until 1990. When it was required, you had to put the nutritional information, how, what the vitamins are, how many much protein. How, I know now that I'm trying to watch my cholesterol, reading that stuff with the fat and stuff, that's really important, but back then, that would be really hard to do. So they did that voluntarily, and so you can see on the left, and I don't know the age of that can, but sometime before 1973, and on the right, that's from a label that was sent from Del Monte Foods in California. They were kind enough to send us a label book. We copied some of them so you can see what the labels look like. But you can see the difference in the kind of information you can get if you're watching your watching what you eat and how you eat and so forth. So I thought that was pretty cool. Okay. <coughs> lima beans, because the factory started with peas and carrots, lima beans came in around 1930. The veggie classic started around 1987 and by 1992, Del Monte, it wasn't selling well. They closed it. Unfortunately, 125 employees lost their jobs with the closing of veggie classics. Now, I'm not saying that pudding was done by the Del Monte plant. But Harlan told me a really great story about bubblegum pudding. That that's why I had to put it up there. So <laughs> I just wanted to share that because I'm thinking, you know, bubblegum. Oh yeah, pudding. Oh, you know, like I don't, I don't, I don't like bubblegum ice cream either. So, you know. but they eventually there were potatoes. Done now, Sherry or Harlan, do you know when potatoes and the peas and carrot combination when those were done? Because I read that that at the factory did that at some point. That was the veg classics, I believe. Oh, it was. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Recycling, and I'm running out of time. I'm kind of over time, so I want to kind of finish up here real quick. Community involvement, um, back in the 40s and 50s, um, the Illinois Department of Health would send trucks around to do x-rays for tuberculosis. Recycling program at Del Monte. They would actually send the blue bins home with employees. Employees would fill them up, take them back to Del Monte, and then Del Monte would take care of the recycling, which I thought was pretty cool. And in the late 1960s, they were also a place for polling. But if you, what, as I'm coming to understand how Del Monte functioned as sort of a society in and of itself, having a polling place on site makes sense for them, and I get that. All right, and when it comes to an end, um, I, I found reading this article, there really wasn't a good answer as to why they closed, just that they felt they could do the work in three factories instead of four, and so the work moved to Mendota, Illinois, Sleepy Eye, Minnesota, and Arlington, Wisconsin. Um, And I wanted to end with this because Sherry shared this picture. I thought this was a pretty cool picture. So um, this is the last pallet on the last day at Del Monte in DeKalb on March 17th, 1994. Packing ended in October the previous year, but the pallet to get them labeled and so forth, that was it. So that's what I know about Del Monte, and again, it's, it's, it's small compared to what has happened over the 68 years they were in our community. There's a lot more to learn. I don't know how much we'll find. I hope we'll find more. But these are some of the things that I wanted to know. Again, going back to my question, Midwest Canning and CalPAC, when did it become a subsidiary? Because it's not mentioned until 1929, but in a history of one of the Del Monte Shield magazines, they're claiming that Caltech was a, 
was in on it from the get-go in 1925. I, I don't know. I don't know. Again, I want to find out more about John Countryman and his role and his connection specifically to DeKalb County. And then, did anyone know that Midwest wanted to build a plant in Genoa? I thought that was kind of interesting. But they said they were going to do a vote up to the farmers, and um, maybe the farm farmers voted it down. I don't know. So. All right. That is my end of it. And I'm sorry I went over a bit, but we have time. And at this point, I would like to invite Harlan and Sherry to come on up. And they're going to share with you some stories of their experience with Del Monte. And while they're doing, and I'm going to interrupt for a second, while they're coming up, I forgot, we have a sign-in sheet, so if you just want to write down your name and how you found out about the program, we would really appreciate that. So if you just want to take that and pass it around while you're listening, I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm trying to get you to share this mic with you. If you want to sit, sit, or if you want to stand, I'll leave it up to you guys how you want to do it. So. I worked in Del Monte from 1977 to 1994. Um, I started as a temp, just going to work the summer to earn money to go to college. Well, I got hired full time and never went to college. Uh, I really enjoyed working there. Uh, when I got hired full time, as you know, the canning season was. Uh, uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So my job was the day off person. So all the regular employees got one day a week off. You didn't know which day it was gonna be, but you got one day off. So like Monday I would do somebody's job, Tuesday I would do someone else's job. So I, I really liked that because I got to do a lot of different things and then I really learned a whole how everything worked because I was always interested in, you know, what made the wheel turn, so to speak. So I always found that interesting. But the temporary people, they did not have scheduled days off. They got a day off when it rained or um, <coughs> the power went out or we had a major breakdown. That was, so they, they would work a lot of times two and three weeks straight. If, the weather was ready. Um, one of the biggest changes I saw when I worked there, um, when I first started, we would get shipments of salt and sugar in 100 pound bags that came in on rail cars that had to be unloaded by hand. Very labor intensive. Well, when they switched it over to liquid, uh, liquid uh, sugar, and then the liquid salt brine, that was such a labor saver, and uh, I just sped the whole process up, and it was just the best thing ever <laughs> for the band. And um, <coughs> one of the funnest things I ever did there, I, I always enjoyed working there, but. Um, there used to be a spring show in DeKalb, and uh, one year I wore a pea costume, <laughs> and I was out about on the floor, and no one knew who I was, but I could see out the mouth, so <laughs> I would tap people I knew on the shoulder, and you know, or dance with the kids or whatever, but it, it was really fun, and I just remember at the end of that show, my cheeks hurt so bad because I was grinning and smiling and laughing. But nobody could see me smiling, but I, I was. So it, it was a fun time. And um, to go forward, probably the worst day there that I ever had was the day they announced the closing. That was just terrible news. So anyhow, uh, our work, the work group we had were really a close-knit family because we were, like, they were our extended family. So um, 
I still know a lot of people that I worked with. We became lifelong friends, and I still communicate with them. And uh, uh, you know, uh, I really worked. I really enjoyed working there. And now that I'm gone, I'm enjoying the pension checks. So. <laughs> Well, my name is Harlan Hawkins, and uh, my first day at Del Monte was June 1st of 1975. My last day was November 30th of 2019, so I spent the better share of 44 years uh, working for this shield. But just to comment on something Sherry said, that, that pea pod costume, that was Sweetie Pea. And once upon a time, Del Monte had, it was up collect labels, send in the UPCs, and they would send you these little stuffed animals. Those, well, not animals, but they were little stuffed toys. There was cobby corn, sweetie pea, there was a green bean, and a, a lushy peach, I think was lushy peach. peach, yeah. So, and that was extremely popular. Uh, they, sold, they, they, they shipped lots and lots of them. But a lot of those labels came straight from the warehouse. They were not taken off of purchased products. Everybody in Del Monte was walking out the warehouse. <laughs> anyway, I think we have some of those. There's two of them on display in the exhibit. Um, you know, in my first, I, I had, I was back from my freshman year of college, needed to get a job someplace, so I applied at Rochelle, Del Monte. Green Giant Belvedere, and I came to DeKalb, and the guy looked at me and he said, can you drive a tractor? I said, well, I was raised on a dairy farm. He said, okay, sign here, and go to the farm shop. <laughs> that was the entire hiring process. <laughs> and I said, where's that? And he told me where to go. And so I got over there and um, talked to some of those guys, and they said, be back here at 7 in the morning. So that was that was it and I, I came back at uh, the next day at 7 they gave me the key to a pickup truck and they said go down to the rice motel or hotel and across the bus stop and see if there are any seasonal workers that have arrived okay the, the rice hotel had once upon a time been an absolutely beautiful place I think it's NIU administration now uh, looking at the woodwork and the stairway ways and it was gorgeous um, I guess uh, 